everyone. Welcome back to True Crime Buzz. I'm your host, Amber, and with me, as always, is Brittany. Hello. What you drinking today? Diet Sam's Cola. <laughs> Diet Sam's Cola. Yes. All reliable. I switched it up today. What are you drinking? Sam was making fun of me so hard when I brought this home, but I went to Publix the other day, and I was looking for another seltzer you know i've done white claw i've done the trulies but i was like i want i want to try a different one natty light (laughs) (laughs) what (laughs) yes sam's like could you be more redneck because they came out with a seltzer and the name is what sold me okay okay it's a cherry lime flavor and it's called the catalina lime mixer (gasps) Ugh, that sounds disgusting Cherry lime? Are you serious? Yes, ew. Gross. No, amazing. You know what? I'm going to try it right now. Okay. It's not going to be good because seltzers are gross. You don't like cherry limeade? I don't even like seltzers, so, and I surely don't like cherry limeade, no. But the name, Catalina Lime Mixer. Okay, now that's cute, but still. It tastes like white trash summer. I'm here for it. (laughs) Okay. All right. It's good. Okay. I feel like I feel like I need to be out at a bonfire while someone is shooting bottle rockets out of their asshole and like some country music's playing in the background. That's what it tastes like. Hey, I know a place where that could happen. <laughs> so do I. We grew up there. <laughs> oh no, I just meant my front yard. <laughs> but you're damn right. It was definitely where we grew up. <laughs> I mean, I was referring to literally anyone's house in our hometown, but yeah, that works too. Okay. So what's your personal true crime story this week? Hmm. My true crime story of the week is the sheer amount of laundry that I did. I did six laundry baskets of laundry. It took me three and a half days. And the real crime, I mean, that is a crime in itself, but the real crime- Oh, yeah. Is that my kids just threw it on their freaking floor. They didn't even put it away after all that work. And here I thought you were going to say that the newest true crime of the week is the fact that you're not going to Crime Con. And I am. Look, that's still too raw. I don't know why you'd bring that up. (laughs) No, so Amber's going to Crime Con. And one of my favorite people in the world is going to be there, Carrie Rawson, which if you don't know who that is, obviously you don't listen to us because that is Dennis Rader, BTK's daughter. And Mm -hmm. I adore her and her bravery and I don't get to meet her because I'm in the middle of home buying. So home buying's ruining my life, my life stream. Maybe she'll be at the one next year. I hope so. Tell her to come back. I will. I'll be like, hey, remember me. Next year, I'll be here with my sidekick, and I'll take all the pictures and get her to sign all the books for you. That's why you're my main bitch, okay? (laughs) So what's your true crime story of the week? My personal true crime story of the week is not just nightmares, but the ones that you think you're awake. Mm -hmm. Like, they are so realistic. So it's one thing to have a nightmare where you're, like, falling into a volcano or something stupid, and you wake up and you're clearly not in a volcano. You're in your bed. You're like, okay, it was a dream. You go back to sleep. But the ones where, and Sam gets these all the time because he has sleep paralysis, and you do too, yes. right? Yes, I do. Okay, so he has the nightmares where, like, he literally is somewhat awake, but, like, his brain still thinks he's asleep and it, like, plays tricks on him. Mm-hmm. I don't have that, but apparently I had a taste of it the other night because I had a dream that I was laying in bed and my husband was next to me, our dog was in between us as usual. And there was this creepy little girl at the foot of our bed with, like, pigtails, but she looked dead. Mm. Like, I had, like, an old white nightgown, and she was, like, looking at me all evil, but, like, doing that little kid giggling. And it freaked me out, and it looked like she was going to come after me, so I pulled the sheets up over my head, and I heard her laughing getting closer and closer, like, she was coming around the side of the bed where I lay on, and... It got quiet, and then out of nowhere, she just started pushing down on top of the covers that I had holding up. So it was like we were fighting between the sheets, and I was screaming because Sam and the dog were not doing anything. So I'm like, help me, help me, like screaming for my life. And I woke up to Sam waking me up and saying, it's okay, it's okay. Apparently, I was like trying to scream in my sleep. Mm, That is pretty scary. And that's rough. 
Because I woke up and it's the same scenery that was just in my nightmare, just minus the little creepy girl. So that was not fun. So then you were wondering if you were inside a dream, inside a dream. Exactly. Some Inception exactly. bullshit. Mm-hmm. Ugh, I hate them. Yes, they're the worst. But anywho, what are we talking about today? Today, I'm telling a story out of Australia, a love story gone wrong. It's filled with an ecstasy drug ring a luxurious lifestyle, and a beautiful Swedish model and her downfall at the center of it all. I'm covering the story of Charlotte Lindstrom, and Miss Charlotte weaved a web that she couldn't get out of. This sounds like a movie and a half, and I am here for it. I feel like I need some popcorn. They need to. They need. This could be a movie, and it should be a movie. Maybe a lifetime movie. Yeah. Charlotte Karen Lindstrom was born August 9, 1984 in Solentuna, Sweden. Her parents, who I couldn't find their names, have said that growing up, Charlotte didn't have any particular goal in life, but that she knew she wanted to be special. So, in 2003, on a backpacking trip, Charlotte originally visited Sydney, Australia with a group of friends, but she loved it and decided to make it permanent by officially moving there in 2004. She got a part-time job as a waitress at the exclusive nightclub Hemisphere in Sydney. And when she wasn't working there, she was booking work as a model. She was living out her dream of being special. I want to go so bad. It's the one place that just seems, it seems like the most beautiful place with the most beautiful people, with the most beautiful accents, and the cutest little animals, and the deadliest snakes and Thank spiders. You. But <laughs> yeah. still, I want to go so bad. Amber. Amber, your fear of spiders. You can't go there. You die. I know. Sam tells me that all the time. I know. But I feel you. I want to go too. It is beautiful. I'm just going to make myself one of those like hazmat suits and just wear that everywhere I go. I'll get the looks. I don't care. <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> like, please excuse my friend. She's terrified of spiders. No, maybe I'll just wear one with you and then people can just think we're weirdos together. I'll take one for the team with you. That's a real best friend right there. So, also in 2004, Charlotte met Stephen Spellavero, a man more than 20 years her senior. But the age difference didn't matter to Charlotte. She was in awe of the lifestyle being with Stephen offered, a life filled with fast cars, piles of cash, waterfront apartments, designer dresses, and a wild criminal lifestyle. So, later in life, while talking to a psychiatrist, she actually said, quote, He fascinated me. He made me feel important and special. He knew so much about everything, and he was manly. I felt safe with him, end quote. Don't they all? Yeah, right, though. Okay. <laughs> Don't try to justify that age gap, boo. We know it was about the money. Mm -hmm. And no shame. No shame. You know, just... Live your truth. <laughs> live your truth. There you go. Charlotte knew that Stephen was both a wealthy businessman and a drug lord. She loved him, though, and thought that she would get her fairy tale ending with Stephen. By 2007, Charlotte and Stephen were engaged. Congrats. Aww. So cute. cute. So cute. And let me just, before we go any further in this, we're going to link the documentary that I watched about this. But this girl is gorgeous. She's gorgeous. She sounds gorgeous. She is. She's beautiful. And not someone you would think that would be involved in all this it's, you know she just looks like real wholesome and sweet and not what she is in this story okay but charlotte's luxuries and over-the-top happy ending came crashing down around her in early 2007 the fire brigade or fire department in america received a call saying there was a fire at an industrial park at the west end area of sydney a place called riverstone so the fire brigade headed that way. They then received a call from a person who at this point was a mystery caller, but spoiler alert, it's Steven Spellavero, saying oh. that he needed to cancel the fire brigade, that his secretary had placed the call by mistake. But the operator informed Steven that she couldn't just cancel it since the fire brigade had been called. They were required to make sure there wasn't a fire. Stephen then tried to divert the fire brigade, calling in a fake fire elsewhere. What? This just went from zero to 60 so fast. Yeah. He starts out by saying it's a bus wreck, and then he's like, it's a car or something. In the documentary, they play the call. <laughs> and it's like, what? 
But it was too late. The fire brigade showed up at Stephen's warehouse, fearing a fire inside, of course. Mm -hmm. And they used bolt cutters to get inside. But instead of a fire, they found a massive drug lab and alerted the police. Ooh. When I say massive, Walter White didn't have shit on this dude. <laughs> and I'm going to give you a rundown of the things they found inside. There were three 300-liter steel vessels and a 790-liter vessel, two 50-liter bee kegs on the ground with specially manufactured distillers attached, and that was just downstairs. Oh, this is a factory. It's a factory. <laughs> I mean, it's a warehouse. It's huge. So then they went upstairs, and that's where they hit the mother load. There are these huge electric blankets covered in orange plastic, and they were covered from end to end in brown powder, which turned out to be MDMA or ecstasy. There were about six kilos of ecstasy just laying on these blankets. Oh, my God. Yeah. Oh, it's crazy. The, in that documentary, they show the footage for it. It's like, what? Holy cow. Also, obviously, which I've never taken ecstasy, but I know that most people take ecstasy in pill form. So when they showed that, I'm mm -hmm. like, what is that? What is that? Because I didn't know it was ecstasy until they went further into it. In the room next door to the blankets were three tablet pressers used to make the MDMA into ecstasy tablets and stamps to stamp the tablets. Altogether, they found 40 kilos of ecstasy, which was $1,027,000 worth of ecstasy. It took police two days to package up drugs and evidence such as Louis Vuitton shoes and a size nine and a gas mask. But most of it was just drugs. Just drugs. That sounds like some bougie drug making right there. Oh, yeah. I could have went super in-depth with Stephen Spellavero, but this is really the story that I wanted to tell, which is Charlotte Lindstrom. But there's a whole, whole nother thing just all about his drug production. And he's written books about it, so... If you want to learn more about him, read those. They also found a lease for the property, which had been leased to K&M Machinery, and the signature on it said John Walker. But John Walker didn't exist, and there was a false address used. So they eventually find out that John Walker is an alias for Steven Spillavero. So they tried for the next 12 months to get evidence on him by doing wiretaps and such, they then go to the manufacturer of the equipment found in the warehouse to see if they could identify Stephen. They said that they had sold the equipment to a man named John Matthews. In fact, John Matthews had purchased so much equipment from this place that he was put on the Christmas card list. On the Christmas card? <laughs> Merry Christmas to your local ecstasy manufacturer. <laughs> Which, of course, these people that had sold the equipment, they didn't know, like, what he was using it for. But no. what? But now that we know, it's hilarious. It is. It's so great to me. It's so great. So the police brought in a book of photos, and they asked the workers if anyone could identify John Matthews. And, of course, they identified Stephen Spellavero as John Matthews. And the workers were willing to testify against Stephen, which made them the key witnesses in the case against Stephen. Their evidence would put Stephen in jail for life. So, the police obtain a search warrant for Stephen's waterfront apartment and go there to serve it. When they knock, the beautiful Charlotte Lindstrom answers the door. Oh, I'd love to know what she has to say. Well, at first, she told them they couldn't come in. Because they were like, hey, can we come in? You know, they identified their mm -hmm. self as police and said, hey, can we come in and have a chat? And she's like, no. Uh, but no. They're like, too bad. We have a search warrant. We're coming in. So they went in where Charlotte informed them that Stephen was away on holiday, which I just love to say that. He was away on holiday. It just, it's fancy. I know. It sounds so fancy, right? Because us Americans just say vacation and that sounds boring. Holiday just sounds. I'm going to say that next week. I'm posting it on all my socials. I'm going on holiday. Catch you later. But he was fishing in North Queensland. And Charlotte did not think the cops would find anything. So she remained confident and cool. And in this documentary, it actually shows them searching. It shows her answering the door. It shows it all. Mm, okay. The police found a pair of Louis Vuitton size 9 shoes just like the ones that had been found at the warehouse. And some excess cash. But that's 
about it. There wasn't anything else that Mm. they found. But it didn't much matter because of the warehouse worker's testimony. They had enough to arrest Stephen. They asked Charlotte to have Stephen call the investigators when he returned from holiday, which that would never happen here. People would, like, find him. They would hunt him down. It would be on. But, you know, the Australians, they're nice people. So the nicest. They said, hey, have Stephen give us a call <laughs> when he gets back from holiday. And he did. He did. He called them. And he tried to get the investigator to meet him for coffee. Really? Yeah. He was, like, certain that if they just talked about it, they could come to an understanding. An understanding about all the drugs and the money and the... Yeah. Okay. He's trying to get on all the Christmas card lists. <laughs> <laughs> yes like, no 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 it's just it's just me it's your friendly neighborhood drug dealer can you imagine that sounds kind of like he was trying to bribe her honestly but oh yeah definitely she was like nope you gotta come down to the police station we're gonna arrest you so he went and he was arrested do you experience digital eye strain from too much blue light exposure from digital screens Baxter blue glasses are not your average frames. These blue light lenses filter 80% of the highest energy blue light, eliminating 99% of glare. The past year, we have all been glued to our devices more than ever. I know as a podcaster, I look at my screen way too much. Our exposure to digital light has soared and our eyes and our sleep are suffering as a result. Baxter blue is also a force for good and provides a pair of reading glasses for someone in need for every pair sold. This is eyewear built for our digital age and Baxter blue is giving our listeners 10% off your next purchase of blue light, sleep, or kids glasses. Click the link in our show notes for your exclusive discount. This is the sign you have been waiting for to invest in blue light glasses. We know you will love your Baxters and we know that you will feel the difference. The investigator described Stephen as nice and polite, but she said as she got to know him, she found him to be very manipulative. While he was in jail awaiting trial, he was in contact with Charlotte. No surprise there. But then a fellow inmate came forward and said that he had important information on Stephen's case. He said that the two warehouse workers that were going to testify had a hit out on them, and they were going to be killed by two men from Victoria. The two men had a criminal past. One was convicted of armed robbery. The other was a petty thief. He said that their plan was to make it look like a robbery gone wrong. And he said that they had been collecting pictures and information on the warehouse workers. And he had a map drawn by Stephen Spellavero. So when that inmate came forward and said that, the police started surveillance on the warehouse. And then around 5.05 p.m. one evening, a car from Victoria pulled up to the warehouse right as they were closing. While the police were keeping an eye out on this car, the warehouse called one of the police that was in the car Mm -hmm. and said someone had called them and asked for the two workers that were set to testify against Stephen by name. Not suspicious at all. No, not at all, right? So the warehouse said that they the guys weren't there and the caller hung up. And the warehouse said that these calls had been happening frequently and always at closing time. So police knew then that the hit on these witnesses, it was, it was true. Mm-hmm. So the police ran the plates on this car and the hitman was like actually stupid enough to use his own car. <laughs> so they knew who the person was. And the police were listening in on Stephen's prison phone calls and learned that Charlotte is planning to meet up with the hitman, so police follow her. Evidently, Charlotte thought that the hitmen were taking too long to kill the witnesses, and so she asked them for a refund. I didn't know you could get refunds on hitmen, but... Like this is a pizza delivery service? Yep, you squished my pizza, refund, only yeah, very expensive late. pizza delivery. They gave her 70,000 of the 100,000 back. And there's videos of her just walking the street with like a white shopping bag with the 70,000 just chilling in there. Oh, God. Open. It's like a gift bag. You would give someone for a gift. Well, to be fair, they didn't really have Venmo back then, you know? No, but (laughs) But it's just a pocketbook. I mean, something that closes. What if the wind blew? There's 70 grand out the window, you know? Yeah, you're welcome, peasants. Take it. Yeah. Charlotte then talks to Stephen and tells him that she got $70 back and would get 30 back Saturday. So they were talking, you know, 
in code. Mm -hmm. Police tapped Charlotte's phone at that point and kept hearing her talk about a solicitor, which is code for hitman. But this still isn't enough. They can't do anything with this, you know. Right. It's not enough to arrest her. Finally, they hear a conversation on Charlotte's phone where a man asks, quote, does he want these people at a hospital or cemetery, end quote. To which Charlotte responds, quote, I think more probably a cemetery, end quote. Which isn't really super deep code. <laughs> I mean, that's pretty clear. Very clear. She later talks to Stephen in tears. She was super upset. Because I guess she felt really bad about this. But she was saying that she doesn't think that any of this is funny. And she doesn't want to be here anymore in this situation. To which Stephen tells her he's sorry he's put her through this. And that it's over. And tells her to keep it together. And she says, quote, I don't want to see those people anymore. End quote. To which Stephen tells her to shut up and quit talking that rubbish. And that he doesn't know what she's talking about. And then he just hangs up on her. What? Asshole? I'm out here trying to get you out of prison and you hang up on me? The audacity. Oof. So May 26, 2007, mid-morning, police arrest Charlotte in broad daylight on the street. She was just walking along. And Charlotte's parents back in Sweden had no idea Stephen had been arrested, much less Charlotte. They had never liked Stephen, understandably. So this is probably why Charlotte had kept them in the dark about everything. But a journalist informed her parents that Charlotte had been arrested. Oh, so they found out the best way through the press. Yeah. So after this, Stephen's mom, Dolores, offered to put up $2 million to get Charlotte out on bail. But this was denied as Charlotte was considered a flight risk, which is not surprising. She's from Sweden. Sounds about right. So, denied. So, next, the police searched Stephen's cell for any evidence that would tie him to the hit and informed Stephen that Charlotte had been arrested and that they both would be charged for solicitation of murder. Meanwhile, while they're doing all that with Stephen, cops were searching Charlotte and taking her back to her and Stephen's old apartment to search for further evidence. They found a notebook that ties Stephen to the ecstasy lab. And love notes from Stephen to Charlotte. And they, like, read them out loud. And this was recorded. So, had to be soups embarrassing for our girl Charlotte. I was gonna say, were these sweet, adorable love notes? Or were these, like, trashy, dirty love notes? No, they were like, we're gonna live our happily ever after. And build a beautiful home together. And, I mean, they were mm. sweet. But also, let's think about who we're talking about here. So, right. how sweet can it really be? <laughs> but, <laughs> exactly. They were, they were sweet, not raunchy. At this point, Charlotte knows she's facing serious prison time and decides that she will snitch on Stephen. She pled guilty on September 10th and gave up lots of intimate details of Stephen's ecstasy production and about the hit and that mm -hmm. sort of thing that he was involved. Stephen and his two hitmen were also charged in the plot to murder, but during trial, Stephen swore he was just trying to dig up dirt on the warehouse workers, not have them killed, and that this was all on Charlotte. Oh, so he meant literal dirt from the cemetery. Mm -hmm. You know, digging up cemetery dirt. Okay, makes total sense. It makes no sense. <laughs> He's an idiot. He thinks everyone else is an idiot is the problem. I think that they are in this story, though, because jurors heard all the audio and watched these videos. Charlotte even testified against Stephen. She had to show up in court wearing a bulletproof vest because of alleged death threats against her. Oh, damn. Despite all of this, Stephen Spellavero and the two hitmen were found not guilty on the charges for the murder plot. How? I don't know. <sighs> okay. Don't tell me this dude's out just being a free man, living his best Wolf of Wall Street life. So, Charlotte was originally sentenced to three years and ten months after pleading guilty, but the Crown appealed this, saying it was, quote, manifestly inadequate end quote and she was denied immunity and they increased it to four years and nine months and that meant she would be eligible for parole may 2010 but that sentence change was a month before she started testifying against stephen which is crazy to think okay mm, okay they upped her sentence she still had to testify against stephen and after all that stephen and the hitman were found not guilty wow it's like, what okay and I mean, definitely they were all three guilty. Yeah. I think we can all agree to that. Seems pretty clear to me. 
Maybe they have passed out ecstasy tablets before trial. <sighs> Crazy. She ended up serving three years at high security Long Bay Prison in Sydney. And while there, she and Stephen wrote each other love letters because, of course, they did. Even still? Yeah. Even oh, after yeah. After all? Yeah. Wow. Okay. Yeah. No, she needs to get a grip. Like, because this dude's obviously just used her and is a piece of shit, but whatever. I mean, not that she's innocent in this. Don't get me wrong. She's not. No, but, but it's like, like. This is not a good relationship. It's toxic. Yes. It needs to go. Thank you. As toxic as those ecstasy tablets you're making. So in her first letter, she told Stephen she was in the same room as, quote, homeless lesbians and heroin addicts, end quote, and that she was horrified that her family knew of her arrest. She also said, quote, Stephen, I am so confused. I love you so much. You're my soulmate, but now I don't know what to do. You're not here to pick up my pieces because pieces is what's left of me, end quote. Oh, my gosh. She also said she would never give up on him. <laughs> so gross. So gross. Stephen said that he longed for the letters, even though reading what pain Charlotte was in tormented him. No, it didn't. No, it didn't. No, it didn't. You just let her, like, take a fall for you when you were definitely orchestrating this kill. And she even said she didn't want to do it after the fact. She wasn't taking part in it anymore. You're like, rotten prison, bitch. That's basically what I took from that. That's exactly how I see it, too. For okay. sure. Well, good. We're on the same page. So, she even compared herself to Paris Hilton, who was also serving jail time at that time. You know, because we got to think, this is 2000s Paris. Okay. She said, quote, not that our cases are the same, but at least that's someone I can relate to a little bit more than a junkie on heroin, end quote. I started out liking this girl for some reason, and now she just, uh, she seems real dumb. Real dumb. Well, I liked her up till her prison letters and stuff, but too, I mean, she was trying to kill two innocent people, so. Right. Not really. Probably shouldn't have liked her before that, but that's not where it started for me. But Charlotte hated prison, hated it, and ultimately wrote an 89-page statement to the Crime Commission spilling all sorts of tea and details on Stephen. Oh. Good for her. What caused the change of heart? Because she hated prison. Like, she was she miserable She was just miserable in there. there that that's all it took to just crumble down that wall of love. <laughs> yeah, Stephen said that she was basically rotting away behind the bars with anorexia. Which, evidently, there was a lot of stuff in the press about how much she weighed and how she looked so skinny. But Charlotte never said she had anorexia, so I don't know. But that's what Stephen says. I mean, but that sounds like a man's words. Just saying. It does. That's also the press. Of course, they're going to focus on somebody's weight. She's in jail for trying to kill people, mm -hmm. but we're going to focus on her weight because she's a woman. It's gross. So, on May 25th, 2010, Charlotte Lindstrom was released from prison and deported the next day back to Sweden. That November, she appeared on Australian 60 Minutes talking about her jail time and crime. Then, in September 2011, an article ran in the Sydney Morning Herald saying that Charlotte Lindstrom no longer has feelings for Stephen Spellavero. Oh. So, that just ran in the paper. Okay. Trying to turn her life around and move on? Yes. That's exactly what she was trying to do, I think. As far as Stephen goes, he pled guilty to running the Riverstone Drug Lab and was sentenced to a minimum of 12 years, which was reduced to 11 years. He has served his time, gotten out, written books, tried to contact Charlotte, who he says goes by a different identity and refused to respond to him. He now has a new girlfriend he met on Tinder. <laughs> of course he did. Of course he yeah. did. Right, though? And, but he still talks about Charlotte all the time. And it's gross because, like, he's profiting. Oh, yeah. And she has said, like, earlier before she, you know, started going by a different identity, she said that, like, she was still getting death threats and stuff. And, like, she's just trying to turn her life around. You need to leave her alone, Stephen. Quit using her name to make you some money. I think you've done enough with your drug labs and your crazy life to make money. We don't need to hear about Charlotte anymore from well, you. Well, I mean, how old was she when all this shit went down? Was she in, like, her 20s? Yeah, she was in her early 20s. Okay, well, there you go. You know how much you change from your mid-20s to mm -hmm. your mid-30s. You are a completely yeah. different person. So, yeah, I don't blame her. He doesn't seem to be moving on at all, except on Tinder, but... Yeah. 
she probably looks at herself the same way we do, but about totally different things. And been like, God, I was such an idiot. What was I thinking? Yeah. Oh, a thousand percent. And I don't think if she intended to keep like living a stupid life, making stupid choices, she wouldn't have changed mm -hmm. her identity. You know? Yeah. Well, good for her. It is good for her. And so that, my friends, is the wild and crazy story of the Swedish model who got caught up in a love affair with a drug lord and ended up serving time for plotting to have two innocent people murdered. That is the story of Charlotte Lindstrom. It's like Bonnie and Clyde, but with ecstasy and a completely different ending. <laughs> Love our podcast? Then hit that subscribe button and leave us a review. We're also on Patreon. Head on over to patreon.com slash truecrimebuzz and join today for access to all our exclusive content, including bonus episodes. You can also find us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at TC Buzz Podcast. And check out our website at www.truecrimebuzz.com. Until next time, cheers! cheers.